The radical phase of the French Revolution had set out to overturn all existing social and political values. It challenged the foundations of royal authority and power by declaring that it was the people and not the king, which was the true sovereign authority in society. Moreover, Republicans had declared war on Christianity and the church. Under the absolutist system, the church had been one of the pillars of the old regime. Radical thinkers had been critical of established religious authorities. In their view, religion was simply a prop used to command obedience, instructing people they should suffer in this life while awaiting their rewards in heaven with God. This mentality only served to make people accept their status in life without question, and for radicals, this was unacceptable. In implementing their reforms, radicals abolished the worship of God and Christianity. They confiscated church lands in the name of the state. For religious officials and the faithful, this amounted to a declaration of war on the church. Anyone exhibiting Christian tendencies ran the risk of being pegged as enemies of the revolution. These ideas were hardly confined to France. From the early 1790s onward, French forces had marched across Europe, with Napoleon's Grande Armée spreading into Spain and up to the borders of Russia, creating new state institutions and governments based on revolutionary principles wherever they went. From the start of the revolution, Aristocrats had begun fleeing France. Entire families left their ancestral estates and took up residence abroad, seeking refuge in European capitals outside French control. Some even traveled across the Atlantic and established themselves temporarily in the United States. This exodus included those fleeing the reign of terror as well as white plantation owners whose property had been confiscated by former slaves on Saint-Domingue. In London, émigrés held meetings discussing how to restore the French monarchy and reclaim their property. In cities like Charleston and New York, colonial plantation owners published petitions in American newspapers demanding that the French government restore their property and estates. Émigré politics had a notable transnational scope as revolution disrupted the traditional power structures and social hierarchies that had governed the European and Atlantic world. In total, some 140,000 people fled France after 1789, while perhaps another 20,000 left Saint-Domingue. All lived lives of exile, some more comfortable than others. What this indicates is that the age of revolution was also an age of refugees. Yet it also indicates that the French Revolution was a European-wide and even global event. It overturned and challenged existing systems, but it also impacted the daily lives of people. The sight of armies and French troops in towns and villages across Europe became a familiar sight. The general population became acquainted with the ideas behind the revolution, and these ideas were frequently discussed and debated in coffee houses, libraries, and taverns in places as far away as Poland and New York. War fundamentally upset society at its most basic level, and for this reason, almost everybody had an opinion on the French Revolution, whether positive or negative. Almost from the start, competing narratives and opinions on the French Revolution were evident. Case in point was the Irish-born statesman Edmund Burke. Burke was a prolific political writer and orator who had a long career in the House of Commons. During the American crisis, he had initially supported the demands made by American colonists against the British Crown. In his opinion, the colonists were demanding the rights and liberties guaranteed to all British subjects. 
Liberty and representative government were, he argued, natural to England because it derived from a long tradition of parliamentary rule in the country. This tradition stemmed from the Middle Ages when the English barons had forced the king at sword point to sign the Magna Carta, a document declaring that the king was not the sole authority in the kingdom and that he had to consult with a council in order to carry out his policies and raise taxes. This tradition had been secured in 1688 with the Glorious Revolution, when Parliament had overthrown a corrupt and absolutist Stuart dynasty. As Burke saw it, American demands for liberty and representation were simply carrying on this tradition. Colonial demands were just because they were rooted in England's history and therefore key aspects of English identity. As Burke framed it, liberty was a British tradition, and British colonists had every right to demand the liberties be preserved. If he was critical of how the monarch treated American colonists, Burke was no more lenient when it came to British India. He persistently warned of the harmful influences of what he labeled Indianism. He watched with unease as British forces seized property in subcontinental Asia, overrunning territories and submitting an entire people to the yoke of empire. According to Burke, the Indian administration was a corrupt and oppressive system of government. And he had to wonder what such an illiberal and corrupt regime would mean for British liberty and constitutionalism. The British government was not only destroying the traditions and history of a native Indian population, he warned. It threatened to pervert the very foundation of British values. In essence, Burke saw the dark side of empire. His criticisms of North America and India both rested upon a conviction that imperialism would exert a negative influence on the country. What would imperialism mean for a liberal society? Would it force Britain to abandon its sound traditions of liberal constitutionalism? Would it corrode and devalue an attachment to liberty in the British people? In posing these questions, Burke came forward as a strong critic of empire and Indianism. For his entire career, he identified himself as a defender of liberal principles and Britain's long tradition of liberty. It was surprising, therefore, that this defense of liberty did not extend to the French Revolution. In fact, Burke was one of the first critics of the French Revolution. In 1790, prior to the rise of the Jacobins, Burke published a lengthy polemic entitled Reflections on the French Revolution. In this work, he denounced the revolutionary movement taking place in France, declaring it an abomination. The doctrines of the revolution, preaching national sovereignty over absolutism and a break with the past, were, Burke railed, morally and politically false. As he saw it, France was violently breaking with its established traditions of royal leadership and sovereignty, uprooting the very foundations that had long ordered French society. In this respect, the revolution was against the nature and historical development of the French people, and as such, could not be considered legitimate in any way. Burke's writings provoked a veritable pamphlet war across Europe. Those who defended the revolution sharply criticized Burke's views. The most heated response came from none other than Thomas Paine, who published his Rights of Man in 1791 in response to Burke. In his book, Paine lambasted Burke as a counter-revolutionary. According to Paine, Burke was a relic of the past, a person hopelessly out of touch with the currents of modern society. In his views and principles, Burke was nothing but a conservative, 
someone who supported monarchy and aristocratic right over democracy and freedom. Whether or not this criticism was in fact just, it was evident that debates on the French Revolution were polarizing politics and creating political positions suggestive of a new political culture and order. The French Revolution had not only given birth to a brand of democratic political radicalism, it had engendered a new way of thinking about politics and society that came to be associated with a new conservative tradition. Henceforth, divisions between liberals and conservatives, or those who supported the revolution and those who opposed it, became a hallmark of modern politics. Concurrent with Burke's conservative reaction, there were others who took an oppositional stance as well. Radical attacks on Christianity and God had offended Catholic sensibilities in France. The clergy was especially critical of the Enlightenment and Revolution, seeing it as an attack on the natural order of society. The Enlightenment, with its secular and democratic ideas, had unleashed man's most excessive, violent, and indulgent impulses. It had been bent on nothing short of the complete destruction of society, and this had led to the mayhem and anarchy of the Jacobins, Catholic polemicists claimed. As the call went, c'est la faute de Rousseau, c'est la faute de Voltaire. It's Rousseau's fault. It's Voltaire's fault. These types of criticism became the foundation of a counter-enlightenment movement across Europe. One that saw a direct link between the values of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. These views became especially strong among the royalist and Catholic emigres that fled the country during the 1790s. Their attachment to monarchy was a key ideological factor that united them. In their eyes, the revolution had attacked the legitimate authority of monarchy. It had replaced traditions of royal leadership with the sovereignty of the people. Yet popular sovereignty was sanctioned by neither tradition nor God. It was therefore an aberration that could only lead to chaos. Without legitimate authority, there could be no peace and no order. Therefore, these emigre communities became strong advocates of a new political principle, legitimism. This view saw dynastic monarchy as the only valid form of government. Europe's political traditions were at heart royalist. Monarchy was what connected past and present. It also provided stability through the transfer of power from king to prince. Monarchs preserved moral authority through the close alliance between the crown and the church. Without these forms of legitimate authority, society would dissolve into anarchy. Therefore, in order to correct the excesses and fallacies of the French Revolution, it was essential to restore monarchy to its rightful and traditional place at the head of the state. These views stressing religious and royalist values became popular among emigres who watched in horror as kings were deposed and murdered, as religious institutions were destroyed, and aristocrats fled into exile. The entire world that they had known was crumbling, and the cause of it was the revolution playing out in France. One such émigré was Joseph de Maist, an aristocratic political writer who had spent the years of the revolution abroad watching his native country fall to pieces under men like Robespierre and Napoleon. De Maist had left his native Savoy and took up residence in Switzerland and Italy. As French armies swept into Central Europe, he fled to Russia, 
where he endured cold winters and longed to return once again to his Savoyard homeland. During his years of exile and after, de Maize vehemently denounced the revolution and its ideals. In de Maize's opinion, it was the will of God, not the reason of man, that was the source of all law and order in society. The Enlightenment and Revolution were founded upon false principles that were hopelessly flawed. As de Maize saw it, the Revolution symbolized God's divine wrath. Just like the Great Flood that God had used to wipe out a wicked mankind in the Bible, so too was the Revolution a divine form of punishment. The Enlightenment had instructed that human reason alone could create the world. It had encouraged people to question their faith and believe that they could found social and political institutions in opposition to God's divinely ordered society. These assumptions had been false and blasphemous. The warfare, tyranny, and bloodshed that had accompanied the revolution was God's wrath upon his ungrateful children, a divine punishment intended to convince man of the errors of his way. In the aftermath of this divine punishment, it was essential to reimpose God's order since the evil influences that had fought against God had now been wiped out and the world purified. If France were to enjoy peace and stability, the key was religious stability, and this meant combating and completely erasing the influence of the Enlightenment. These ideas became the basis of a new ideology in France known as ultra-royalism, a right-wing movement bent on undoing the revolution and returning society to an idealized past vested in the sovereignty of God and monarch, not the people. In the minds of these so-called ultras, the revolution had disrupted France's traditions, and until these traditions of Catholicism and monarchy were successfully restored, French society would never know true peace and stability. De Maist and his cohorts envisioned a particular type of organic society. The Bible taught that man was imperfect. He could therefore not hope to create a perfect society. Only God could promise this. For these right-wing religious writers, society derived from traditions, history, and religious unity. This is what the revolution had set out to destroy. And in its aftermath, this is what had to be preserved and protected. Many of these ideas found support at the highest levels of European society. Kings and monarchs threatened by a revolutionary France intended to bolster support for a return to solid royalist principles. And it was one chief European leader who, in particular, would prove instrumental in this respect. In 1809, Clemens von Metternich was appointed foreign minister and chancellor to the Habsburg Empire. His appointment came at a challenging time for the ruling Habsburg dynasty in Vienna. Napoleon's armies had swept through Central Europe, shattering the traditional Holy Roman Empire that had historically underpinned Habsburg predominance in the region. With Napoleonic victories across the continent, French expansion threatened to eclipse Habsburg power on the continent permanently, an outcome that Vienna was not willing to tolerate. To this end, Metternich was committed to building an international coalition against Napoleon and pushing back against the French armies. Between 1808 and 1814, he worked closely with Prussia, Russia, and Britain, building an allied coalition. Over the coming years, allied forces waged a war against Napoleon's Grande Armée in Germany, Italy, and Spain. 
they took advantage of Napoleon's imperial overreach, which had spread French forces thin across the continent. They bargained and negotiated with local rulers and princes, encouraging resistance to French occupation on the ground. These tactics proved successful. Within the span of two years, Napoleonic power in Germany and Italy collapsed while Allied forces drove French armies out of Central Europe and the Iberian Peninsula. In 1814, Russian forces managed to invade France and occupy Paris, unseating Napoleon and putting an end to his revolutionary empire. Once a superpower that had dominated Europe, the Napoleonic Empire now lay in ruins. The French Revolution was being brought to a conclusion, not through the efforts of a triumphant Napoleon, but at the behest of allied monarchs who had little appreciation for the values of liberty and equality that the revolution had promoted. A conservative monarchist and absolutist, Metternich was a virulent critic of the French Revolution and its democratic agenda. In his opinion, the revolution had threatened religion, public morality, law, and tradition, the very principles upon which societies were built. Societies required these elements if they were to be stable and secure. Without them, a society would degenerate and fall apart. And this is exactly why the revolution had spiraled hopelessly out of control in Metternich's opinion. The only hope of correcting the errors of the revolution was to restore the authority and institutions of the old regime and combat the rise of an anarchic popular sovereignty. It helped that in 1814, Metternich was the chief diplomat presiding over the peace negotiations being conducted in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars. That September, he convoked a diplomatic congress in Vienna attended by all the European powers. At this meeting, the victors sat down and began discussing what a post-Napoleonic order would look like for the European continent. This was no easy task. Napoleon had fundamentally destroyed the old state system. On his march across Europe, he had created new states governed along constitutional and national lines. In no uncertain terms, Napoleon had radically changed the political geography of Europe. It was now up to the Allies to sort all of this out deciding what territory should be returned to dynastic rulers and how best to reimpose royal government on the continent. These decisions couldn't be made carelessly either. To do so might invite another round of warfare. After nearly 25 years of war, Europe needed peace. Metternich knew this, and so a balance of power had to be restored in continental politics. In addition to these pressing territorial and diplomatic concerns, it was also evident that the legacy of the French Revolution had to be addressed. The ideological principles of monarchy had been attacked. There were still Jacobin sympathizers across the continent who had no desire to see monarchy restored. If Europe was to have peace, the ideas that had fomented revolution had to also be combated and constrained. And on this issue, there was some debate on how to proceed. Russia, Austria, and Prussia, collectively referred to as the northern courts in diplomatic circles, were absolutist monarchies. In their perspective, ideas like democracy and nationalism posed a chronic threat to their interests and self-preservation. These revolutionary ideas had to be suppressed and it would be up to the dominant European powers to ensure that they were. Therefore, it was proposed that a holy alliance be formed between the powers. First and foremost, this alliance would serve to ensure that France could not pursue an expansionist policy again and threaten international peace. 
However, this alliance went further. It would also be a conservative bulwark against the spread of liberalism, nationalism, and revolutionary ideas across Europe. The great powers would serve as Europe's policemen. They would be expected to enforce the status quo and protect the principles of legitimate government wherever they might be threatened. Although France and Napoleon had been defeated, this did not mean that radicalism was in fact dead. Underground Jacobin clubs and radical political networks continued to operate, and conservatives worried over what these pockets of radicalism would hold for the future. It was not unimaginable that they would mount opposition movements to monarchs, unleashing terror and continuing the struggles of the French Revolution. These insurrectionary and terrorist groups needed to be dealt with, and it would require international cooperation among the leading powers to do so. In this holy alliance, Metternich and his allies were calling for a war on revolutionary terror. They pledged themselves to the tasks of uprooting secret societies and networks across the continent in the name of peace and security. Upon hearing this, the British Foreign Secretary, Charles Stuart Castlereagh, objected. Although Britain had fought against Napoleon, he could hardly expect liberal opinion back home to agree to such a reactionary policy. Castlereagh, therefore, proposed a more moderate defense alliance against France, one that would secure peace, but not commit Britain to a counter-revolutionary crusade. However, outvoted 3-1, to one, the conservative policy passed. The implications of this new turn in international policy, which now pledged leading governments to a counter-revolutionary agenda, would become evident in the coming years, as the powers dealt with the legacy of the French Revolution. In particular, it was events in Germany that would demonstrate the tensions evident in Europe's post-revolutionary politics. By the early 19th century, nationalism was exercising a powerful force in the German states. Napoleon had enlivened nationalist sentiments, but many intellectuals had also used appeals to nationalism to repel the French invasion. In expelling French forces from Germany, princes and radicals alike had called for a broad war of liberation against French occupation, urging Germans to rise up and found their own national government. While Germany was liberated from French control, in the end, the dream of a united and democratic German nation was not realized. Despite this, however, German students and intellectuals remained committed to the program of German national unification, demanding a German fatherland for the German people. Ideas of German unity and culture were popularized among fraternal organizations in German universities known as Burschenschaften. In these Burschenschaften, university students would meet and discuss the ideas of German intellectuals and philosophers, they would read traditional German folk poetry and discuss German history. Most importantly, these fraternal groups saw themselves as activists and hoped to spread the idea of German nationalism to the people. These fraternities organized peaceful protests and festivals to draw attention to their cause. At these festivals, students dressed in traditional German clothing and recited folk poetry as a form of protest. While the authorities suspected that these Burschenschaften might be a breeding ground for German radicals, the peaceful nature of these protests discouraged authorities from shutting them down. However, in 1819, an event occurred which changed this. The incident involved the poet and dramatist August von Kotzebue. In the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, 
Kotzebue had taken a job as an envoy for the Russian Tsar. His responsibilities consisted of drafting regular reports on the situation in Germany and sending them back to St. Petersburg. Typically, this entailed nothing more than translating newspaper articles and political tracts into Russian. However, Kotzebue was also a sharp political critic as well. He routinely wrote articles against democracy and nationalism in the German press, and this drew anger from many German political activists. Some even began to suspect, incorrectly, that he might be acting as a spy for the Russian government. In 1919, a theology student named Karl Zahn came to his house, requesting an audience with the poet. When Kotzebue appeared at the door, Zahn drew a dagger and stabbed him to death on the doorstep, condemning him as a traitor to the German people. Zahn was arrested, and in the investigation that followed, it quickly became known that he was a radical member of a local Burschenschaften. Charged with murder and conspiracy, Zahn was executed later that year. For many students, though, Zahn was a hero. He had been defending the honor of the German people, and his execution brought waves of protests led by German fraternities. As these national protests gained attention, Metternich decided to convene a meeting in the Austrian city of Karlsbad and organize a response to these demonstrations. At Karlsbad, Metternich called for a joint Austro-Prussian police force to monitor the universities and arrest anyone suspected of engaging in forms of political protest. The German press became subject to heavy censorship. Radical student activists were sought out and jailed in an effort to break up secret organizations accused of spreading dangerous ideas. That year, Metternich gave full legal force to his counter-revolutionary agenda, issuing a series of laws collectively known as the Karlsbad Decrees. These new laws transformed Germany into a virtual police state as authorities hunted down nationalist and democratic groups in an effort to silence them. In the new war on revolutionary societies, the reactionary program outlined by conservatives was now given international backing, suggesting that the battles between conservative forces and revolutionaries was about to enter a new phase. The revolution may have been finished, but its afterlife remained a pressing threat to stability the war on terror outlined by Metternich and the Holy Alliance intended to ensure that the furies of revolution remained at bay. And for conservatives, there could be no middle ground in this struggle. The fate of European society itself now hung in the balance. <laughs>